when you were first diagnosed, is that because it says on here that you was that Sony Records um, decided to relieve you of your contractual obligations because yeah, they didn't think you were so. So there's there's, there's a bit of a because it's funny, you know, when you start you start reading comments about yourself on the internet that and and people run with these narratives and then they become and after a while you stop, yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 and people run with it. So it, it wasn't it wasn't as sinister as because I, I read some comments like Sony found out that Ren had mental health problems and then dropped him, which really wow. really wasn't really wasn't how it how it panned out I, so i was i was working with an amazing guy called eric papale who who did the defamation of Str strickland banks that first plan the plan not the first plan b record but the plan b record that went massive and made him huge for he was on top of the that's the one where on he started the, singing d singing more kind of motown so motown stuff, stuff yeah and, and eric eric was a big big contributor to that and so eric spotted me so, so was, he, was he an a and r but, guy or is he like a producer no, he was, he's just he's just a brilliant musician man he's a producer so he, he, he's a, and, and a very good human being as well but he he's he was walking past while i was busking when i was 18 19 years old and um I was busking one of my own songs and he was just like, man, your lyrics are incredible. I'd love to take you to London and make an album with you. And, and we started the process of doing that. And so, and then Sony took it, he, they were a subsidiary of Sony. So they were a sub label of Sony and Sony took that on board and we signed the contract and we were working on this album. And then halfway through this album, I became very, very sick. And, um, uh, and I started, I was almost like pretending I wasn't sick because I was, this is my whole you know up until i was 10 years old i was it was like this thing that was manifested and the thing that you said like i was doing all these industry showcases and all that stuff and people were like you know it's going next next big thing and uh, all, all this stuff was happening and, and i was in the process of making this album and um i was just so this is when the symptoms started and i was feeling dissociated tired pain started happening in my body and th there, were, there were times where I'd be in the studio and I'd, I'd do a take and I'd excuse myself to go to the bathroom and I just there was one time I threw up blood and then just pretended that it hadn't happened and I came back and I carried on before doing the take without letting anybody know and there were other times where I'd have these industry showcase and I'd be in the back seat of a car crying and, and I'd be sleeping and then I'd get off there brush it all off and get on stage but it, it there came to a point um I was managed by a guy called Andrew Mancy at the time who was had done the chemical I think he'd been the manager of the chemical brothers um but um there'd be the, the, there was a point where I started breaking down on stage as well um because I was just so weak like even standing and singing on stage became this massive and people started obviously noticing this and there was that i think there was a time where eric was like you know you need you need to take some time out and so i i, I did that and i was very aware and I, and I took time out of making this album which was a really difficult thing to do i went to live with my mum, and it was intentionally only going to be for three months but i didn't end up getting out of bed for a whole year um after that and and about six months into that it was a very mutual conversation between me and and, and eric um at the time running through sony with this contract i was, I was just like i i don't think I don't think I've got it in me to do this and Eric understood it and and we parted ways and and it it, it wasn't so much that it was a, a dropping it was more that that contract expired because you know there there, there are a certain amount of years and I that was very early that was maybe 2001 and I I probably didn't really have much of a life then up until 2006 2007 so um yeah so it it was just you know the, these terms of the contracts of maybe three years or something like that it just the time the time passed and 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 it never it never happened and um it was it was heartbreaking man because because in my head i was like but this is my prime early 20s everybody always tells you that this is the best time to do all this stuff and so it was really difficult like i i was i was pretty sure that that was my chance and it had come and gone and 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 more so the more time that elapsed um the more it felt like that and um yeah. and then uh, when i started making the freckled angels album which was it the freckled angels album was actually half of the tracks that i made with eric and i remember messaging him one day years years later and asking him if i could use the tracks and he was just like go for it which is really nice of him he didn't expect anything in return um and i, I still there's there's still part of me that feels i i haven't reached out to him in uh, since back then because there was a part of me that felt almost like a guilt for letting them down for having so much belief in me and pouring so much time into me and um, I felt immensely guilty for not finishing that project, and I I, I did feel I, I, feel, I, I did feel you shouldn't feel guilty though because I think like the whole 
nature of the traditional music trade is that people like him will invest a lot of time in a lot of artists that they believe in, like yeah. yourself. And then some of them are going to fly, some of them will not, for, for a million different reasons. Most of them won't, you know. And they yeah. only need like one to fly to justify the corner office <laughs> you know, they, no, they're going to be okay no of course of course and you know it, it's not it's not that he was struggling for, for money in any sense because I guess yeah. there was the defamation and the and he, and he did a lot of he was responsible behind Daniel Beddingfield and a lot of other people's amazing production yeah. but but um, it was I think it was just more that there was so much belief and excitement in that recording process and um, and, and to, it, it wasn't really that I had let him down through my ability that's what I was frustrated by it was this insidious outside force that i had no control over that just ruined everything and and yeah it was it was for a long time it took me a while and when i started making the freckled angels album when when i i got i guess myself to a point with my health where i could still record i was still spending or every day in the bedroom but i had my music set up in my bedroom i couldn't really leave my house at this point but i decided i i'd pretty much at this point i'd in my head i was like i'm probably not going to live to see 30 so i'd like to do something that i i feel i've always known that i've had this potential to contribute musically to the world i like to make this even if it's only my mates to see it. i want to finish this freckled angels album so that's what i did i i, I used half the tracks that we did uh, back in those early days and then i produced things like crutch and make my way and, and dominoes and a few things just by myself in my bedroom and i threw together this like 16 track album which i self-released and it did mod modestly okay it was really just my friends streaming it now it's seeing a lot more views because everything else has become successful but um I, I, and then i just self put it out there just thinking like this is going to be my contribution and i'll probably die in a few years and um yeah um so, um, it's all about legacy. So, uh, that's the, that the recorded medium. That's just it's your legacy, isn't that, it? That's so. that's it. Yeah, and yeah, so it's actually it pretty was, healthy uh, to uh, think so like that sometimes. It's like because when it comes to the many demands on our time as artists and people who you know who want to talk to us in, in any in any context, really, it's like everything that you do, you have to decide whether it's content or art. And the stuff that's art, that's really your legacy. The rest of it is completely disposable. Yeah. And it's just the way you communicate the fact that you do art to the rest of the world, isn't it? So that, that, stuff's, that stuff's important. I mean, I think when you have like profound health issues, it does make you think more carefully about what you're going to be leaving behind. But everybody should think like that. Of course. All the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because we are, we are a, f a um, finite creature. We will expire. All of us will. So like the, the, it's just that when it's very much in your periphery and, and it could be any time in the immediate future, you start thinking about it a lot more. But the truth is uh, we're, we're all, we're all, <laughs> it's a very bleak <laughs> way to put it, but we're all, we're all just heading to our inevitable demise. So, but the, the, the um, it, it was interesting. So I, m I made this album, I put it out there. It felt really good to have that out there. I started posting it from my house to people that wanted it. And you know, there were the very manageable orders um, coming through. And then uh, my health dipped again after that really badly. I, and I, I went into full blown psychosis, I guess, I guess is my brain's way of creating an alternate reality that was more explainable than my actual situation. So like I was because because it felt so unfair like I, I there was no doctor could diagnose me what was going wrong this was still before i knew i had lyme disease and and also as well after i after the allopathic medicine had let me down and, and there was nobody because i kept I, I must have gone to the doctors hundreds of times being like please just test my blood for something else there's something going wrong i just got feeling like and, and they kept going ren look we've spent a lot of money the nhs spent a lot of money looking at your tests there is nothing wrong with you it's in your head like some doctors would even laugh at me for going yeah but i looked at this on google and they're like oh you're looking on google yeah like look, it google quite a snobbery <laughs> yeah doctors hate that don't <laughs> quite, quite a quite a patronizing way and and um so so I after the allopathic medicine let me down and you know I, I'd gone through the mental health system I'd been on various SSRIs and like citalopram and whatever and diazepam and they hadn't worked and so I started turning to the spiritual because that's the only option I could see left like or, or, or homeopathy or uh, um, 
weird i've done some not not to call that weird but i've done some weird things i went to see shamans i went to see exorcists i went to see anything that i thought might work i i, I and, and i was broke at the time as well i come from a working class background not so so all of this stuff was it, i'd save up for months and do this one thing that i'd pin my hopes up and then it wouldn't work or or sometimes i'd convince a spiritual healer to see me for free and pour my heart out and um it's just like you're to take so many disappointment after disappointment after disappointment, it's like, it's really difficult to just carry on going. And um, I didn't really know at the time that all of these experiences was concealing some gold. But anyway, that all accumulated in just a massive breakdown. And I, I just went into this mode where I thought, this can't be anything other than demonic. And I was convinced that, because I couldn't figure out an explanation. So I was convinced that there must be some either sort of de demonic entity possessing me or following me and then and then beyond that and that took me some weird places i had conversation with satanists and stuff like that. it's really weird dark period in my life and uh, or i thought i was part of this experiment and my psychosis manifested itself in this way that i was like if i start acting in a way that's not expected of me i can short circuit this reality and and i can break out of it so i started doing really bizarre things and that there was one time i stripped off butt naked and I went and lay in the middle of a, a main road and started laughing in hysterics until the police showed up. And um, uh, and in my mind, that was like, this is what they expect the least. So this is going to help. And obviously none of it helped, but it, it was so funny. So during this psychosis, I started manically, I was there was still part of me that was very lucid and present. I started manically looking up on the internet and I found out about this condition called P-A-N-D-A-S, pandas, which is this condition or autist a subsect of autistic kids has caused by the streptococcal bacterial infection and i and i was like a lot of my symptoms look the same so i convinced my mum to take me to a gastroenterologist and i pretended that i had these these this gut pain to to which he would prescribe and i said oh i'm i'm i've had this antibiotic before i made up this lie and and i know that this one i i, I get on really well with so he prescribed me this short course of antibiotics which was actually against the streptococcal bacteria what I didn't know at the time was it also targets Lyme disease. I, I didn't know this at the time, but I, I was on a different tangent that took, actually took me to my diagnosis. I took this antibiotic and all my symptoms went down by about 50% after two week course of taking this. And I was like, that's not placebo because I've taken hundreds of supplements, hundreds of self-treated things on my journey to try and make myself better. This isn't placebo. I, I, I know this by now because I'm very familiar with the placebo effect. So I go, it didn't cure me because after a while those symptoms came back. So I, I saved up money. I went to an infectious disease specialist in Brussels. I explained everything, my whole story, and he, without even testing my blood, he was like, "You've got Lyme disease, mate." And um, they tested my blood, and sure enough, antibodies to Lyme disease positive, and that took me on another big journey to try and um, cure myself of Lyme. Okay.